Hey, oh. Where are you going? In there. I live here. Fuck off. I'm Arya Stark. This is my home. Walking into Winterfell for the first time, seeing this extraordinary exterior set, I feel a little bit like a, a neophyte because I just assumed Winterfell was a real castle, you know? And so I walk into this set and it's just extraordinary. I know from the pilot it was a real castle and I guess I just kind of assumed that part of it was still shot. And though they built this thing and they made it bigger this year. The art department this year have just done the most incredible job. The Winterfell set that I'm in at the moment is just completely built from scaffolding. Every year, we get to see a little bit more because we add on courtyards, we add on catwalks, and we add on interior spaces that give you a sense of what's going on inside these keeps with the corridors and the hallways and the different rooms of the castle. This is uh, Winterfell Gate. That's the front, uh, front entrance to, to Winterfell. As you can see, there's quite a bit of damage that has occurred over the past winter. These sets were not designed initially to last seven seasons. It's all plaster work and, and timber at the end of the day that we construct sets of. They're not real. And as a result, there's always maintenance to be had. Out here is mainly kind of paintwork, but when you go inside, you'll see there's a lot more to be done. Obviously, we've had the Winterfell battle last season. One one breaking through the gate. These are kind of the remnants of that action. We've put the original panels back because we want to show that they are preparing for the coming winter and for coming battles. This is obviously is completely bare. There are no props in here. The greens will have to come. They will have to take a lot of the greenery out. We'll need to relay the floor a little bit. This is all weather. The floor is suddenly kind of quite uneven. It's just rain damage. So we're now we're in the second courtyard. Again, you know, quite a bit of damage. The steps have all collapsed. It's not that bad, actually. It's still in, in, in very, very good condition. The guys just need to replace a few of the boards on the walkway. But overall, it needs a really good repaint. In addition to the original courtyard from season one, we built a second courtyard for last season, to which we have added a third courtyard this season. Deborah Riley, our designer, designs the sets. We then take these designs and work them into practical working drawings and then supervise the builds as well. These are obviously not the canvas anymore as such. We are putting a window at the end here in order to kind of ring the changes that can bring us from the second courtyard into our new build, which is our new courtyard. These are mother and father's chambers. And? This year, obviously, we have more characters in Winterfell areas coming back. Sansa and, of course, Jon Snow. As a result, each of them have a room. Bran has a room. Suddenly, instead of having two rooms, you need four. Then also, there's a lot of action in corridors. There's a lot of intrigue going on where people are following people. So, you know, all of that needed developing. This is Jon Snow's room, which used to be Ramsay's room. We've kind of rebuilt this slightly. There's a window here now. We've changed things around. We've changed the fireplace just to kind of do this a little bit differently. As you kind of, kind of find your way through, you'll find your way into Sansa's room, um, and from there, kind of all the other rooms as well. So this is Sansa's room here. Everywhere still some construction to be done. You know, the fireplace is still being built. There are certain things that can probably kind of do with a little bit more. This hasn't been finished, finished yet. Well, it's, this has. They started taking this down, aging this. What's that? Maester Welkin built it for me, so I can move around more easily. It's a very good idea. I have designed a lot of stuff for Bran Stark. He doesn't know it, but I'm his personal transport designer. <laughs> There was a lot of opinions on how it should look and how it should feel, and uh, the concept artist went through numerous designs before that was actually approved for us to then make. Now he's the three-eyed raven. He has quite an austere character, so it was a, you had to not design any decoration on it, and it had to be the Winterfell colors, quite pared down, and then using the wood and the leather keeping it really simple, so it reflected his character. It has to be practical, but it has to look, period. So the, the, the trick is to 
kind of disguised the mechanics of it at times. Once it was done, everybody was happy with it, and it was comfortable also for the actor and was able to function properly. The North needs to band together. The Winterfell fire backplate, it's the second one we've made over the last two years. If it was something that you could just have hanging at the back of a set, there wouldn't be that much of a problem, but because you want to light a real fire in front of it, we have to use special fire retardant materials. We then have to generate huge mold, which is very expensive, very labor intensive. A prop like that is something that doesn't really get much camera time, but it's just all part of the process. One of the great things about having a show that's gone on for many years, for all the departments, there's a degree of accretion where you just keep adding layer and layer and layer and things become more rich and complicated and uh, lived in. And that all adds to the realism of the world. They have done such an extraordinary job. All of these sets are, are bigger than you can imagine and more detailed than you can really even experience frame by frame in a show. It's quite an adventure. Silence was one of the early sets and it had to be one of the wow sets, which it was. We had to create that really actually in about seven weeks. Because we didn't have a lot of time, everything just had to go perfect on that. We're in Bambridge doing the boats for the sea battle. Yara's ship and Euron's boat. Uh, the silence. Halka Richter was the art director of that set and he was working with a concept artist named Philip Shearer. The silence was my favorite and my least favorite set at the same time. It was quite obvious that everyone's vision was very very different. Someone imagined the, the ship to be like Chinese influenced but these are also ironborn so some of us were looking more like in a, in a Viking direction. To bring all of this uh, together was like the, the big the big challenge. Through research, we started to look at Roman sort of biremes, triremes. We were looking at medieval ships. The boat's an amalgam of a lot of different um, great Warcraft um, that were built over the different centuries. So it's not quite like any one in particular, but it's a lot of different ones mushed together. As we planned the battle out, we realized the boat itself doesn't really come into play as a real thing that people need to interact with until it's connected to Yara's ship. So we decided that the best way to put across the true size of this boat and still make it possible and functional was to build a section of it, the bow section that rams into Yara's boat. The art department designed and built the first 50 feet of the silence with the idea that visual effects would then extend that. The great thing was because Philip had worked in, um, in 3D on the computer when he was designing it, it meant that these ribs could then be farmed out and cut and perfectly delivered so that the boat would go together like it was out of a kit. When the thing is then assembled, you get the skeletal structure of the ship, and then we just start to clad it. So it was very much a carpentry-heavy set. We have marine guys who will come over and help us on these things. All the rigging came through them. They'll splice the ropes, they'll hang the ropes, put the sails up, do whatever they can to get this car park ship ready for battle. I work out the drawing to scale everything down to make the sail the shape it is. Then we ordered the fabric, which is now is a black acrylic canvas because it's got to be strong. There's also a special effects sail, then that's put up on the ship as well, so they can work out all the uh, details in special effects. If you look at Roman or Greek ships, they often had animal designs in front. Euron obviously has a kraken as a sigil, so it kind of befits the character, and it makes the ship look so much different from any of the other ships that we've had before. Being on that boat, my boat, they only built it like the front of my ship and the side of it, and it was like five times bigger than their little tiny boat. Looking at it from the outside, it's quite extraordinary because it's so exciting to just be in the presence of something that's so well designed and perfect. The silence is Euron's mother ship, and it's supposed to intimidate people when they see it, and it's supposed to strike fear into the hearts of his enemies. Euron. We are on the top deck. We wanted to make it look more like a fighting deck, so, you know, that's why the constellations, the, the idea that it's almost like a mini castle on a deck. 
we fell in love with this idea of a thing called a corvus, which is a kind of like a bridge. It was a device that the Romans used to enter an enemy ship. So they would lower the corvus, which had a spike that looked a little bit like the beak of a raven. That's why it was called corvus. Corvus is Latin for raven. It would literally sink itself into the deck of the enemy ship. <laughs> And the guys come streaming down and then run onto the ships to murder everybody. We were such a great, humongous, mean-looking thing, so it just seemed like the personality match with Pilu's rendition of Euron. It is quite clearly a warship. It doesn't transport people. It transports death and destruction. The loot train is our biggest scene this year by far. The loot train involves a lot of different departments, all sort of working at the very extremes of their abilities. We're in a park called Los Baracas, which is a natural park here in Extremadura region of Spain. What drew us here originally was the, was the strange rock formations, which um, are quite unusual. Barracos was probably the last location we found because it was at the end of our two weeks tour the end of 6,000 kilometers in a van, <laughs> we finally found it. What we were looking for location-wise was just basically the biggest field we could find. Uh, I had to have some water on it because there's um, the river comes into play, but all really we just needed a massive field because we're gonna have the Dothraki galloping in, we've got a massive Lannister wagon train, we've got the dragon flying, you need a ton of space. When I first read the outline, I did think it'll be exciting to be doing a battle, but there'll obviously be nothing for the art department to do because we have an amazing location and we'll put some wagons in and we'll set fire to them. And how wrong I was. We initially received concepts of about five medieval-style armoured vehicles in horse and cart form. Then we hired five carts from England. We then had to sort of dismantle those carts, modify them in a way to work precisely with the concepts. Everybody in Spain then did the actual set dressing that was associated with them. One cart in particular, which would, was, would we call the, the hero cart, um, we had to work very closely with the director of photography along with the set decorator as this cart needed to be lengthened so that certain camera angles could be established. From a green's point of view, I think it's possibly one of the biggest sets that we've tackled. It needed to look very lush and green before the battle actually commenced, so we sort of looked after that and we did a lot of clearing. We've got lots of rock piles, artificial rocks that look very, very much like the ones that you see around you now. You have horses charging down the side of the hill, so we have to take everything out, stones, bushes, anything that could hurt the horses or the riders. Usually, on a sequence of this scale, we would take the back foot, might just be blood puddles or a handful of things, but because the entire sequence is a wagon train and involves 27 wagons and there are various bits of dressing, we have to reshuffle the entire set constantly, which means dressing 180 degrees or 360, depending on the camera movement. We are providing all of the objects that are um, dressing the set, so the wagons, the things in the wagons, the urns, the pots, the dead animals. As a painter, we sort of age them and make them feel like they fit into the environment. And I think it's good that um, maybe when you're watching it, it doesn't necessarily stand out. And that's, that means we've done our job. It started off a big loot train and everything was um, intact. And then the dragon comes along and blows it all to smithereens. There's different stages throughout the three weeks that we're shooting so we have a whole team of dressers that come and do the changes as this set sort of gone further and further into the battle and you know dragons have been and fires happen and 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 now what we're doing is we're making it look very charred and burnt and lots of sort of crispy critters hiding everywhere there's a lot of continuity to make sure that we're in the right space in the right part of the process, reflecting the right amount of burn, the right amount of damage, how you keep that going it takes an awful lot of effort. We have an eco-friendly dye which dyes things black to make it look very charred and burnt. And we're using several forms of ash as well to dress in and make it all look authentic along with charcoal and stuff like that. It's a big special effects bonanza. Everything that we provide will then have to be burnt over a matter of three weeks. So we're building carriages, we're building wagons, 
knowing that everything is going to end up as ash by the end of it. This is going to be crazy. It's a big battle. There's lots going on. We've got crew doing lots of different things here. There's hundreds of extras and horses and fire. I knew it was going to be crazy and fun too. Frozen Lake sequence is so ambitious that I don't think any of us really understood what we were getting ourselves into. Bernie Caulfield and Chris Newman pushed to have it in this quarry, which is half an hour outside of Belfast. It's called Wolf Hill Quarry. I remember we went there and it was actually a nice day. What we didn't realize was how bad the weather was going to get. Start clearing out, please. Let's go. All the rain comes heavy again. Wolf Hill Quarry can be a very unforgiving environment weather-wise, a lot more brutal, especially in November, December, than the places we shot in Iceland. It's worth it to get those characters out there where it really is freezing cold. What you'll see on camera is exactly what it is. It will be a very raw, cold, freezing environment where these characters are utterly exposed to the elements. We looked at the location, and then it was like figuring out how you can create a frozen lake. We worked with some engineering contractors. These guys came in with big machinery. We've done a lot of quarry work, and I know that one man with some of those big machines can shift an awful lot of earth in a day. It has to have a flat surface. Ice forms in flat pools. It doesn't have a hill. So we had to concrete it so it was a hard surface, so no mud could leach into the fake snow and so on. In the end, we put down 11,000 square meters in area of concrete, which is nearly three acres, to create that vast area of frozen lake. When you stand up on the top and look down, it was like we were building an airport or something. It looked amazing. And I'm sure the people up in the International Space Station must have been thinking, what on earth are they doing there? Like it was, the scale of it is enormous. We built the island in the middle like we would build a set. The island was built out of a mixture of real rock and then plaster work to actually get the shape correct. The island in the middle had to be very specific to contain the action. So we had the area where Tormund is, where the Hound is, where Jon Snow is. You know, those areas all had to be kind of worked out. Where we need a place for Jon Snow to fall down, so we need a little step in the rock structure. And the same, really, for the Night King area. Deb wanted it to have a real dynamic to it, so we used our own plaster, fiberglass sheeted rocks, but they were done in such a way to give the thing a drive. It's moving forward, this thing. It feels present. When I came to set for the first time and saw this lake, I understood it was concrete and that they had actually made it, uh, that blew my mind. That island they built in the middle of the lake, it looks like a real island, you know? And the way they've, they've made the, the lake look iced over, yeah, it's incredible. And then, of course, you know, you can't talk about that set without acknowledging the snow team. They've been there for an inordinate amount of time, just snowing piece by piece by piece, so that what you end up with is very nearly a 360-degree set. We try to shoot in quarries whenever possible because they're just massive open spaces that we can turn into our playgrounds for whatever we need. We built some walls to take us from Iceland into this lake to sort of make believe that we were in the same environment. When you film something in another location and then you're responsible for finishing that location off somewhere else, um, you know, you have to really do your homework and try and make sure that you match it as best you can. And so all I can hope now is that the conditions that they have in Iceland when they shoot the first part match the conditions that we had when we shot in the quarry. For the Frozen Lake, we initially received a concept where numerous White Walkers were pulling a huge dragon out of the lake. This was going to be a very visual effect heavy scene, but still we knew that you know the actors required to appear to be pulling something heavy. We created like quite a large chain. It was all about figuring out the size of the links and how we'd get enough tension on it. We needed to manufacture almost 400 feet of chain, which I think was about a thousand links in total. And then they were all painted with like a rust finish and they'll actually get snow on the day up there. I can't believe the scale of this thing. This is an hour of television. I started in September and I won't be done until February. That's nuts. Game of Thrones.
when I go up there now and I see them filming, it's like, wow, did we really do that? You know, I still sometimes have to pinch myself. Okay, let's go for it. Here we go. We're rolling. We're set. We're set. We have a fantastical storyline which requires us to suspend our disbelief and what the art department does in these sets is it makes it real. The art department is this show. It's just such a major factor in why this show has worked. Nothing happens here without us taking the time to discuss it and to really think about it. I hope the audience understand and enjoy that because it's something that we take great pride in. That's why we do win Emmys because we obsess over a scroll that's in the back of shot and is totally out of focus. Pretty much everything that you see on set is created by the art department. It's great to see your work being appreciated, but I would say, conversely, that a lot of our work is invisible and it should be invisible. If I was the five-year-old version of me and I found out what I'd be going to be doing, I'd be like, over the moon. <laughs> it's cool, it's like playing. We're just creating worlds, that's great. Can't really get anything better than that. The sets are so authentic that you feel yourself step into another world. When you walk on a set that you've concepted, it's a very surreal, exciting experience. I actually can't believe I have the job I have. It's fantastic. Well, they're just all so real. Everything, everything from the weapons to the dressing of the set, it's absolutely nuts. If I wasn't an actor, I'd work in the art department. Working in the art department is like an extreme sport. It's a very intense environment where a lot of things are happening very, very quickly. I don't know how Deb sleeps because she had so much work to do this season and she'll have so much work for the final season that it's, it's kind of incredible she's still cheerful when you see her. 